Hi, Artemis Paint here. This is the fourth part about how to read horse racing markets for the purposes of trading on the betting exchanges. This is, by far, the most important video in this series. In this video, I'll explain how to read form for the purposes of trading. Form is everything in trading. Once I started to use form, I could take a trading idea that didn't work and turn it into a strategy that does work. So we're talking about combining form with logical reasoning to filter out weak trading conditions, thereby leaving us only with good trades. And don't worry if you can't read form. I'll explain how to read form with the assumption that some people who are watching this video have no prior knowledge of form. So let's get started. This video is a sports trading video. Sports trading is gambling and I'm not giving any advice, I'm just giving my opinions. This video is part four and the last of this series. In the future, I'll make shorter videos. In these shorter videos, I'll assume that viewers have watched this series of videos. I made this series so that we're all on the same page with the same knowledge base. In this video, I'll explain how to read form. There is a product that I'm an affiliate for mentioned in this video. It's not any old product that I'm mentioning just to make some money. It's a product that I'm an annual subscriber for myself, and it helps me to read the form of a race accurately and quickly. So what is this video about? I'll cover two very short topics before I go on to explain how to read and use form. The first topic is about how reading form sets you on a journey. On this journey, ideas lead to more ideas. This section is fairly general, however it's important because I explain what we should be aiming for in our trading in the long term. Secondly, I'll explain how form can turn a minus EV idea into a plus EV strategy. And this is an explanation of how skill-based gambling works. Thirdly, I'll explain the most important form variables. I'll explain the concepts in relation to finding a drifter. However, the idea is that you'll be able to apply these concepts to any trading idea. You can take form as far as you want to take it. I'll just explain the form variables that I believe are essential in this video. So let's get started. Our trading game should be constantly evolving. We should always be looking for new ideas. Reading form allows us to do this. During my time as a trader, my style of trading has evolved. This video series has been about laying the favourite during the last five minutes pre-race. I've just used this as a model because that's how I started trading. However, I probably have easier methods that I use on a more regular basis. This is what I do these days. I do morning trading, trading favourites and non-favourites at two minutes pre-race, dobbing and in-play trading. If you're not yet winning at trading, this might seem like an impressive portfolio of trading methods. However, it's not that impressive because all of these methods are based on exactly the same idea, and that is using form to make them work. And I'm not, I'm not skipping from discipline to discipline like the gurus. They use financial trading concepts such as volume and resistance points for trading five minutes pre-race. I've already debunked the use of these kinds of concepts in sports trading in, our, in articles and in a video. They use front runners and a list of numbers that they call statistics for dobbing. Again, I've debunked both of these ideas in a recent article. 
The use of front runners is touching on form, while the use of dobbing numbers only sounds like statistics. And you can find both of these articles on my website. In the dobbing article, I go on to explain how to apply form variables to dobbing. With the morning trades, I lay the odd favourite. I look for weaknesses in the form of last time out winners. I don't make much money from this mainly because I keep my stake low. Liquidity is low in the morning. In addition, as I mentioned in previous videos, if you've staked too high, there isn't an easy way out of these trades when they go wrong. You might be wondering, if I'm only making a few quid out of this, why do I do it? Well, firstly, all the money adds up in this game. Secondly, and most importantly, if you follow an idea and keep thinking, this idea may generate new ideas in the future. I'll give you an example. As I said, my first trading idea was laying favourites at two minutes pre-race. I went from there to backing favourites and non-favourites at two minutes pre-race. All I do is look at the form. If I think that the horse's form is strong, I open a trade by backing around two minutes pre. However, I only do this when the horse's odds have drifted from the bottom of its range or better still, when they've just stagnated. I look for a horse with decent form that has been neglected in the betting. I don't want my horse to look as if it's in trouble in the betting. In this example, the horse looks to be in trouble in the betting. The odds might come back down, however for me it's generally not worth the risk to get involved when I see a graph like this. I also don't want to be in a situation where the horse has been back to a point where I don't think that it will be back much more. In this example, you don't know whether the betting will continue on this horse or whether it will drift or whether it will just stay around the same odds. I just want to see enough of a drift for it to have room for the odds to move back down. My thinking with these trades is, trades is that the form is good Therefore, I expect money to come for the horse at some point. If money hasn't come by two minutes pre-race, it's likely to come after this point. So there are two aspects to this tra these trades. The first is selecting your horse. The second is getting your timing right. Selecting your horse can be easily learned. The timing is more about experimenting and tweaking. So I went from trading favourites at two minutes pre-race to trading the non-favourites. So I started looking at the form of the other horses. And basically I look for a horse that hasn't been running badly and its speed rating suggests that today's race conditions are perfect for the horse to run its best race. And when it came to trading outsiders, there was often a liquidity problem. I like to enter a trade with a stake that's small enough for me to exit at a single tick point. Because of the liquidity problem, I started to look at dobbing these horses. In this situation, I back a horse first and lay it in play. The next problem was that the horse that I wanted to dob would get back down pre-race. I would, I would miss trades because I didn't like the odds that it had been backed down to and this led to in-play trading, and in this situation I do the whole dob trade in play. Therefore, instead of placing my back bed bet for the dob pre-race, I would place this in play. Now obviously I need the odds to go up in play, and I only do this type of trade in long distance races. I never try this with short distances. I'm explaining this for several reasons. Firstly, trading isn't confined to the last five minutes pre-race. You can trade at any time that you find an angle. Secondly, when you use form, you're going on a journey where ideas are likely to lead to more ideas. Thirdly, all of the methods that I used are essentially based on the same idea. And fourthly, and this is important in this day and age, we want to develop strategies whereby we can make money by using small stakes. There's been a lot of talk in the media about 
potential affordability checks. To avoid such problems, we need to develop methods that have a high, higher return for small am amounts of money. Typically, trading on short price favourites within the last five minutes involves using high stakes for a small return in terms of the percentage of your stake. For these trades, a 10% win is quite a large win. For morning trades, I probably average a 20% return, so I would call 30%, a 30% win a big win. For dobbing and in-play trading, I get a 100% return on my wins. I also have a 100% loss when I lose. The point is that we need to learn strategies which enable us to win with small stakes. In addition, when you're using small stakes, it's easier to trade at the betting exchanges which have lower liquidity. Gambling isn't just about exploiting, it's also about adjusting to the changes in the situation. I'll give you an example. I used to be a backgammon player, I really liked the game. However, at some point, online backgammon started dying and the poker boom was still going. I'd never played poker in my life and I wasn't particularly interested in the game. However, I knew that I needed to learn the game because that's where the money was at the time. And when poker started dying, I started match betting as a stopgap. From there, I discovered trading on the betting exchanges. Another example is gubbings from bookmakers. I don't get gubbed. It's not even an issue for me anymore. I've only been gubbed by three best odds guaranteed bookmakers. And as far as I'm concerned, Best odds guaranteed bookmakers are the only bookmakers that count. I know what game they want me to play. They want me to back favourites that a lot of punters bet on. In other words, they want me to bet on exposed favourites. They don't want me to bet on outsiders. So I comply. I do what they want. Gambling is all about finding ways to stay in the game. If you're not in the game, you can't win. And all good gamblers know that you don't kill the goose that lays the golden egg. I still make money from the bookies, I just make the money sl more, uh, more slowly. So let's talk about how to turn a minus EV idea into a plus EV strategy. In this video, I'll explain form from the viewpoint of laying a favourite. As I said, the backing first strategies are the easiest. If you watch this video, it should be easy to work out what criteria you need for a back first trade. I can't provide a recipe for winning at trading based on form. It's about being aware of how each form variable affects your trade. So you should always be asking the question, does the variable have a positive or negative effect on my trade? So whatever trading idea that you're working with, you would ask this same question. So anyway, how can we turn a minus EV idea into a plus EV strategy? Well, let's say you start with an idea that is minus EV by 5%. In other words, your idea in its basic format doesn't work. Now you look at the form and you find a variable that supports your trade. This might increase the EV to minus 4%. Let's say you find another form variable that supports your trade and this improves your trade to an EV of minus 2%. And then you find another supporting form variable and your trade is now at a plus EV of 1. Does that sound logical? Well, the thing is, my results of trading like this are consistently even better than logical. I don't think that different supporting form variables have an additive effect. I think that when you have enough supporting variables, you hit a critical point where the EV increases massively. Therefore, a few key supporting form variables can move your trade from minus EV up to 50% plus EV or even higher. So that's how I always try to turn a basic 
minus EV idea into a plus EV strategy. And of course, you have to be asking the right questions when you read form. So let's look at some factors we want to identify in the context of the early drifter. So bear in mind that compared to other trades that I've mentioned, such as finding a good horse to back because it's stagnated in the betting, the early drifter is quite a difficult trade. So firstly, for the early drifter, we want to identify in the no horses. These are horses where only the stable connections know how good the horse is. I said in the first video in this series that sometimes we can differentiate punter money from stable money. If money comes for an in-the-know horse early in the day, this is likely to represent stable money or stable information. I mean, you could argue that all horses are in-the-know horses since we never know whether a horse is trying to win. However, when I talk about in-the-know or insufficient information horses, I'm referring to the types of horses that punters don't have enough information on to assess the form. This means that punters are less likely to bet on such races, and if punters don't bet on a race, the bookies won't be manipulating punters. And worse still, when there's, an inf when there's insufficient information, trainers can and do allow their favourites to drift before coming in with the money. And this means when there's insufficient information on a horse, this part of the graph is li less likely to represent weakness. Our model graph depends on the first part of the graph representing weakness, and since we don't know whether the first part of the graph represents weakness for an insufficient information horse, we want to identify and avoid races in which the favourite is an insufficient information horse. In fact, with almost all of my trading strategies, I exclude races in which the favourite is an insufficient information horse. And even if the favourite is exposed, if there are too many insufficient information horses in the favourite range, I avoid trading on such races. The second reason that we need to read form is to identify horses that punters are likely to bet on. And this may seem counterintuitive, but we want to lay favourites with reasonably good recent form. And this is because when the market hates a horse with strong form, this is often a reliable read. In this situation, the punters are betting on a horse, yet the horse is still drifting. And this combination suggests that there's something wrong with the horse or that the horse has opened at odds that were too low compared to the horse's probability of winning. When a horse has solid form, we can't differentiate stable and punter money. However, if a solid form horse looks as if it's in trouble in the betting, it suggests that the stable isn't behind the horse. So the third reason we might want to read form is to assess how likely the backing will be on the second favourite. When you have a read on the first and second favourite, you're in a strong trading position. And this is especially the case when you think that the favourite is likely to drift and the second favourite is likely to get backed, or vice versa. It's not helpful if you think that the odds of both the first and second favourite will go in the same direction, as you want one to play against the other. Most of the time we can't get a read on both horses. However, when you can, you have a trade that you can be more confident of. The fourth reason for reading form is to develop your own trading strategies. If you think that all you need is a few trading strategies to be set up for life, you're mistaken. I've been a gambler for a long time, and one thing that I've learnt is that edges don't last forever. They come and go and this can be for a range of reasons. Therefore, the skill is to keep finding new edges. So let's move on to how to read form. So here's a list of form variables that I'll talk about. If you've never read form and you think that this looks like a lot of stuff, it's not. 
Most of this takes a couple of seconds to look up. And the average punter knows all of the stuff on this list, so it can't be that difficult. So let's start with form figures. You can find form figures by looking the race up in the racing post. You can also find them by mousing over a horse's name on Betfair. In the racing post, form figures are listed at the left of the horse's name. The numbers represent the placings that a horse got in its previous races. Therefore, a 1 means that the horse won the race, a 2 means that the horse came second in the race, etc. A 0 means that the horse was unplaced in the race. I put a red square around the form figures for the horse called Hakiki. The form figure for the most recent race is on the right. Therefore, going from most recent to least recent, you would read the form figures from right to left. So, Hakiki has won its last race. The dash represents a change of racing season. So, the horse won its last race of last season. It was unplaced in the race before that, and it won its two previous races. If you look at Marie's Diamond, it has more of a variety of numbers. It came second in its last race, and the dash represents the difference between seasons. There are usually a maximum of six form figures, including the dash, that are on the Racing Post's race cards. We wouldn't be trading on Marie's Diamond because it's not favourite. However, if a favourite had Marie's Diamond's form figures, we could consider trading on the horse. What we're interested in is the difference between horses where there's insufficient information and horses that are exposed. Marie's Diamond is exposed because it has run a lot of races and it hasn't won recently. Even if you don't know anything about form, the fact that it has run a lot of races without a recent win means that the horse is likely to have shown its limits in terms of its ability. Hakiki, on the other hand, is not fully exposed. Because it's won four out of its last five races, the horse may be better than its best form. It does have a race in which it was unplaced, however this could have just been a bad day. The main reason that Hakiki is a candidate for trading is because it's the last time out winner, which will make it attractive to punters. So, what does an insufficient information horse look like? Here's a race where the first and second favourite have run just one race and won it. Even if they didn't win the race easily, they might improve after just one run. The third and fourth favourites have never run a race. You can tell this because there aren't any form figures next to their names. Therefore, the third and fourth favourites are at the extreme end of insufficient information. And by the way, this also illustrates how easy it is for bookmakers to identify match bettors who use odds matching software and don't look at the form. Such match bettors could be betting on any random horse and normal punters don't back horses that are having their first ever race. Arbors who don't look at form can get caught in the same way. Here's a table with all the form figure numbers and symbols that you might see, and what they mean. I won't go through each and every symbol as the table's self-explanatory. So we look at form figures in order to categorise a horse into unexposed, exposed and last time out winners. Lots of form figures generally means that the horse is exposed. A small number of form figures means that the horse is relatively unexposed. A number one as the horse mo horse's most recent race means that the horse is a last time out winner. There are a couple of other symbols that I want to point out. The C next to a horse's name means that the horse has won previously at the course that it's running at today. The D means that the horse has run over the today, one over today's distance. When the C and the D are combined in one grey box, 
it means that the horse has won over the distance at today's course. If the C and the D were in two separate grey boxes, it would mean that the horse has won over this course, but it has only won over today's distance at another course. When a horse is a course and distance winner, it's more likely to get backed. This is because horses often run better at particular types of courses. I'm not saying that such horses always get backed. I'm just saying that a horse that has won over the course and distance has an extra variable in its favour. The other symbol that's important is the BF. This stands for beaten favourite. This means that the horse was favourite in its previous race and, and it got beaten. Again, such horses may get backed. You'd have to look at the form in full. However, the trainer might be positioning the horse for a win after missing out in its last race. In addition, it's worth looking at whether the horse was backed heavily in its last race, which I'll show you how to do later in the video. So, race comments. You can read comments on a horse's previous race by clicking on the horse's name and either mousing over a race or clicking on the link for the race in the racing post. So what do I look for? I mainly look at race comments for last time out winners. I want to see if a horse has won its race easily or if it was a tough finish. So here you can see that the horse won its race readily. That's an easy win. Words such as easily, readily and comfortably suggest that the horse had a lot to spare in the tank. If I'm considering laying such a favourite, I want to see stronger signs that the horse is weak in the betting compared to a last time out winner that looks weak on form. In other words, when the horse has very strong form, we want to have less doubts about it being weak in the betting. For horses that didn't win last time, I don't really bother looking at the race comments. However, for all horses, I look to see if the horse was heavily backed in its previous race. My thinking is that if Connections thought the horse was going to win its last race, they may still have high expectations for the horse. Therefore, even though it messed up its last race, they may be expecting it to win the next race. Now, obviously, I need to know that the previous and current race are comparable to reach that conclusion. So, ideally, the horse that I'm thinking of laying won't have been heavily backed in its previous race. So, in the comments, you can see the odds that the horse opened at and the starting price. So, this horse opened at 10, uh, 100 to 30 and the SP was 9 to 2. Therefore, the horse drifted from its opening price of 4.3 to 5.5. So this would be a positive variable if we were thinking of laying this horse. Although, just because it drifted before, it doesn't mean it will drift again. However, if we're considering laying a horse, heavy backing in its previous race would usually be a negative variable. We can also look at the non-favourites and see if any of these were heavily backed in their previous races. If they were heavily backed, this is a positive variable when we were thinking of laying the favourite. So here's a list of terms that are used by the racing media to describe ways that horses win races. The term pushed out is a relatively easy win, with the jockey just using his or her hands. Therefore, I'd view the top two groups on the list as easy wins, with the horse winning with something left in the tank. Driven out and all out are tough wins. I consider these terms to be weaknesses in the form. It usually means the horse won without having anything left in the tank. And ridden out is somewhere in the middle. I wouldn't see this as strength or weakness. You will need speed ratings to assess form. This is a screenshot of Inform Racing, which is where I get my speed ratings from. I blurred the horses' names for the video. 
On the race cards, you can see the speed ratings for the horse's last three races. You can see more of the horse's past speed ratings if you click on the advanced search link. I'm an affiliate of Inform Racing, therefore if you buy Inform Racing through my affiliate link, I get a commission. I'm an annual subscriber myself. My affiliate link is on my website. You can shop around for speed ratings, there are other products, I'm just saying that I use Inform Racing. There are speed ratings in the racing post, however they're not set out so you can easily see the speed ratings of the past races of horses. There are other benefits of using Inform Racing. You can see the draw, run style, whether the horse is racing in a higher or lower class than, its pre in, it, than in its previous race, and how many pounds the horse, is, how horse has gone up or down in the weights. These are all on the race cards, and you don't need to go clicking on links and waiting for information to load. You can also click on the advanced search and get speed ratings just for the racing conditions of the current race. For example, you can get the speed ratings for a particular distance, going and course direction, either individually or combined. In this example, I've looked up the speed ratings on good going. So that's Inform Racing. We use speed ratings to assess the speed of the favourite compared to its competitors and determine whether non-favourite drifters might get backed during the last five minutes pre-race. Speed ratings are important. Firstly, there are top speed rated favourites. Occasionally, you get a favourite that has a speed rating that is a lot faster than its competitors. These are the types of horses that can end up getting back down to very short prices. These are the types of horses that non-form reading traders end up losing money on because they see the odds have gone down by a large amount and they believe that the odds must go back up at some point. If I'm considering laying such horses, I need to be more sure that they are weak in the betting compared to a standard trade. It's a similar principle to laying easy last time out winners. The horse has to look as if it's in trouble in the market for a lay first back second trade. Then there are top speed rated non-favourites. These have potential to get backed heavily. This doesn't always happen. However, if I see a horse with the top speed that is just flat lined or is on a slight drift at the two minute pre race point, I consider it to have potential to get backed. The number of days that a horse has been off the track is a variable that can influence market confidence. In the racing post, the number of days since a horse's last race is shown below the horse's name and to the right. For trading, I like to see recent form on the favourite. There are two exceptions to this, which I'll explain in a minute. I only consider form to be recent if the horse has had its last run within the last 30 days over long distances. This would include one mile four furlongs and above on the flat and all jumps races. For shorter distances on the flat, I like the horse to have run within the last three weeks. If a horse has been off the track for over six months, I'm starting to view it as an unexposed, insuff insufficient information horse. Most punters like to see recent form. Therefore, if we trade on favourites with recent form, we're trading on the same races as punters. As I said, there are situations where we might consider trading on horses that have been off the track for a long time. The first is high class races. I'll talk about class a bit later. For now, you need to know that high class horses don't race often. They're usually saved up for the top class events. What about low class races? In this case, I want to be able to measure up how strong a favourite is. If a horse has recent form, you have a good idea of its limits. However, if a favourite has been off the track for a long time, 
I try to figure out why it's been off the track. Then I try to figure out if it's likely to have returned as a better horse or a worse horse. Horses can be off the track for a wind operation or because they're being gelded. I'm not sure how this affects the horse's performance. However, I assume that the purpose of the operation was to improve the horse's performance. Another legitimate reason for taking a horse off the track is the going. For example, let's say a horse runs well on firm ground and poorly on soft ground. If the ground has been soft for months, a trainer might choose to give the horse a break. If you can't think of a legitimate reason for a horse taking a break, the, cor- the horse could have had problems. If the horse was running well before it took a break, I assume that it's been taken off the track because of problems. Although the problems may have been fixed, I expect the horse to be as good as its last performance is, or worse. This makes it a candidate for a drifter. In this case, the market will usually tell you quite clearly if the horse has lost its form. If the horse was running poorly before it took a break and comes in as favourite, I would be more cautious about laying the horse. This is especially the case in a handicap. If the trainer has fixed the problem, the horse could have been could be a handicap good thing. This is because the horse will have dropped down in the handicap while it was running poorly. Now its problems are fixed. You don't know how good it, how good it is. It could be as good or even better than its best ever performance and be running off a really low weight. If such a horse is getting heavily backed, I wouldn't want to oppose it. However, this doesn't matter for non-favourites. If a non-favourite was running badly but has a good speed rating and has dropped low in the handicap or is a class dropper, it may get backed. As punters will be uncertain whether such horses are on form, the connections can allow these horses to drift and come in with the money close to the start of the race. And this will help our favourite drift. You can see the going and the distance of a race on the racing postcards. Punters prefer horses that are running over a distance that they've won on in the past. If I'm considering laying a horse because I think the odds will drift, it helps to know that the horse doesn't perform well over today's distance. This means that the horse has run over today's distance in the past and performed poorly. This is not the same as the horse never having run over today's distance. If a horse has never run over today's distance, you don't know whether this horse will perform over the new distance. Only the trainer and connections to the horse will have this information. The betting will tell you whether the trainer and connections believe the horse can run over the new distance. As this information is hidden to the public, connections can allow such horses to drift before coming in with the money. The going is the state of the ground. On turf you have firm, good to firm, good, good to soft, soft and heavy ground. Over the all weather you have standard and standard slow. As with distance, a horse that has never raced on the going is not a proven failure on the going. And you need to use deduction to be sure a a horse can't race on the going. Let's say that a horse raced on soft ground years ago and failed. Does this mean that the horse can't race on soft ground? Well, if the horse ran well on different, different types of going at the time, it could mean that the horse can't race on soft ground. However, if the horse was a failure on every type of going that season, it doesn't mean that the horse can't race on soft ground. As with the distance, the betting will often tell you where the connections can uh, believe that the horse can run well on the going. If you want to see how a horse has performed over the distance and going in previous races, you just click on the horse's name and look through the horse's previous races. You can see the horse's position in each race and distance and the distance and going it ran on. So why is this important? 
Well, it should be obvious that in-play traders should need to know whether their horse can run over the conditions of the race. As I've explained previously, it's also important for five-minute pre-race traders. When there's, when there's a question about the going or distance, a horse's odds may drift. If a horse's odds drift, it's important to know why. In addition, if money comes for such a horse during the day, you need to be aware that the market is saying that the horse does get the going or distance. If you look at any race in the racing post, you can see the class that the horse is racing in today. We also want to check what class a horse has been racing in in the past. You can do this by clicking on the horse's name. If you look up the horse's history, you can see the class that the horse has raced in in previous races. The class is abbreviated here. C1 means class 1 and G3 means group 3. The F stands for female horses. You can see the class in its unabbreviated form by clicking on a race. And you can also see the race comments. The rankings of class goes from class 1 to class 7. So this is a class 1 race, and it also says group 3. So what's the group 3 all about? There are also subclasses within the class 1 category. So these are ranked lists for class 1 races on the flat and over the jumps. Earlier I said that when a horse has been off the track for a lengthy period, this could be a sign of problems. This doesn't apply as much to higher class horses. Horses in low cl lower class races tend to run fairly regularly, while high class horses are often saved for high class events. As high class events don't take place that often, it's fairly normal for the higher class horses to be off the track for lengthy periods. Obviously, if a class 1 horse was off the track for six months, I would look at that. However, if a class one horse was off the track for two or three months, I wouldn't consider that as unusual. I've used the term class dropper previously in this video. So a class dropper is a horse that is running in a class below the class of its recent runs. I pay special attention to class droppers that have dropped down by two classes or more. The class horse can get backed heavily, even if its speed rating isn't great, and even if it doesn't appear to have been running well. If the class horse is favourite in getting backed, I would generally avoid opposing this. In other words, class is a negative variable for laying at the bottom of the range. Awareness of class horses is also important when looking at silent drifters among the non-favourites. As I've said, when I'm looking to lay a favourite within the, the five-minute pre-race period, I decide whether there's any likelihood that the non-favourites will get backed. In this case, I'm not concerned about the number of days that the horse has been off the course, or the going, or the distance. These factors are probably the reason that the class dropper is not at shorter odds in the betting and why it's drifted. You do have to check for other factors. For example, you should check that the horse has been racing at a higher level regularly and that it wasn't racing at a higher, cl higher class as a one-off. In addition, you, do, you have to make sure that the horse has been running okay in the higher class. It doesn't have to be running well. However, if it's always coming last in the higher class or not completing the course over jumps, I wouldn't take the class dropper seriously. So let's look at handicap ratings. Looking for horses that are well handicapped on their best form could provide the basis for a trading method. In horse racing, there are two main types of races, handicaps and non-handicaps. In handicaps, horses carry weights to match their ability, such that, theoretically, each race should end up in a dead heat. There are many reasons why this doesn't happen, such as a horse's preferences for different goings, distances, course types, and course direction. In non-handicaps, the rules vary concerning the weights carried by different horses. Horses are weighted according to age and gender. 
In addition, a horse may carry a weight penalty if it has won a race at the same grade as its current race. For the method that I'm explaining, I only trade in handicaps and class 1 races. The reason for choosing handicaps is because you get more horses with exposed form and more horses tend to be fancied in the market compared to your standard non-handicap. I also trade in class 1 non-handicaps. These often have competitive betting because everyone's trying to win and competitive betting is good when you're planning to lay a favourite. When you're looking at the racing post, a handicap race will always have the label handicap. If the word handicap is not in the title, the race is a non-handicap. After a horse race, the horse's weights and official handicap rating are reassessed and adjusted by the official handicapper. This means that a horse can drop down in the weights if it hasn't performed well for a string of races. A way of assessing a horse is to look up its last winning handicap mark and comparing it with today's mark. If the horse's handicap mark today is significantly lower than its last winning mark, this tells us that the horse is well in at the weights. I'll give you an example. Where it says OR, this is the horse's current mark. OR stands for official rating. The horse I was interested in was Where's Jeff? I wasn't interested in laying this horse. At the time of taking the screenshot of this race, I was thinking of laying the favourite, Hauser Black, within the five minutes pre-race time period. I took the screenshot a few hours before the race. Because I wanted the favourite to drift, I was interested in figuring out whether Where's Jeff might get heavily backed at some point. So Where's Jeff's current mark is 68. So let's look at Where's Jeff's past races for his last winning mark. The last win the horse had is here. If you look at the fifth column, it says 1 out of 11. This means that Where's Jeff came first out of 11 runners in this race. The handicap mark in this race is shown in the third last column. It shows that the horse won off a mark of 81, which is significantly higher than his mark of 68 today. That's a good sign. Another good sign is that the race in which Where's Jeff won off a mark of 81 was a Class 3 event, and today's race is a Class 4. However, there are question marks. The going and the distance today are different from the horse's wins. The distance is 1 mile 1 furlong today, and its wins were over 1 mile and 4 furlongs. However, the horse has previously won over 1 mile 2 furlongs, which is close to, to today's distance. The going today is good to soft, and its winds were on good ground. So I checked the horse's speed ratings on good to soft ground. I used Inform Racing for the speed ratings, and I found that the horse can run on today's going. So the next question is, why today? The horse ran off the same mark in its last race and didn't win that. However, as traders, we're not interested in the result. We're interested in the betting. So we can bring up that race and we can see that it was backed from 4 to 1 down to 3 to 1. The odds ended up at 100 to 30. It's not mega backing, however, it was backed. Therefore, all in all, I would expect this horse to get backed at some point. However, I still waited for some kind of a market move. The horse had drifted in the morning. However, I did see a market move about two hours before the start of the race. Then close to the two-minute pre-race period, I laid the favourite. The favourite drifted and Where's Jeff was backed in quite heavily into two-point-something. 
Comparing the last winning mark uh, with the current mark can help to predict if non-favourites might get backed. And remember, this must be combined with a market move to give some sign that today might be the horse's day. Now you might be thinking that it's a lot of work to go through runners comparing their last winning handicap mark to today's mark. However, there is a shortcut. This is a screenshot from a racing post-powered website called Before the Off. It's a free-to-use website. You can find potentially well-handicapped horses at a glance on these cards. In this column, where it has the heading Well-Handicapped, potentially well-handicapped horses are highlighted in green. The Before the Off cards are using a slightly different method to the method that I explained to find well-handicapped well horses. I compare today's mark with the horse's last winning mark. These cards are comparing today's mark with the horse's highest winning mark. Whichever method you choose, the why should it win today question always exists. There's a fine line between a well-handicapped horse and a horse that has completely lost its form. As I said, to have a reason that today may be the horse's day, you need to check that the horse's recent runs aren't really bad, check that today's racing conditions are perfect for the horse, and you need to see a market move. Another variable that you can see on these cards is whether the horse is racing in a higher, lower or the same class. In this race, all the horses are racing in the same class as their previous race, apart from Sandy B. The green downward arrow means that the horse is going down in class. If there was a red upward arrow, this would mean that the horse is going up in class. Many horses have a preference for running on a left-handed or a right-handed course. If you're using speed ratings, you'll often find that a particular horse's speed is dependent on the direction of the course. In other words, a horse might run faster on a left-handed course compared to a right-handed course, and the situation may be the opposite for another horse. If you want to look at course direction in the racing post, you have to click on the course, and then on course map. The advantage of using a service such as Inform Racing is that you can put in variables such as course direction and it will give you speed ratings for just that course direction. Course direction is obviously important for in-play traders. It may be also useful for pre-race traders. The average everyday punter doesn't look at speed ratings for different course directions. And I've found that when a horse gets back during the day and there's a negative variable that may be missed by the average punter, these horses tend to drift during the last five minutes before a race. Remember, the odds are reset to their true chances of winning at the start of a race. Although the draw and run style are probably more important for in-play traders than pre-race traders, any advantage or disadvantage is likely to be factored into the pre-race odds. Therefore, an awareness of the draw and run style is also important for pre-race traders. On flat races, the stall that a horse comes out of is numbered. This is known as the draw. Some race courses have a bias where winners are more likely to come from certain stalls. Depending on the race course, it's usually the high or low numbers that have an advantage. If you want to look up the draw, you can use the before the off race cards. So this is the same race card that I showed you earlier. The draw is shown in the column headed with the word bias. The horses that have a draw advantage are shown with a green bar, while the horses with a disadvantage are shown with a red bar. In addition, the bigger the green or red bar, the bigger the advantage and or disadvantage respectively. Horses have a running style. The run styles are listed in this column. You'll see that the 
a letters H, M, P and L at the top of this column. This is what they mean. You might wonder why run style is important. Well, an in-play trader needs to know if the race is going to be run in a way that suits his target horse. And there are a lot, a lot of scenarios of how a race might be run. I'll give a simple example of how the race is run can be important. Let's say you want to back a front runner pre-race and lay it in play. And let's say that your trade depends on your horse being the front runner for at least half of the race. If your horse isn't the front runner, you'll probably lose your trade. If there are other horses in the field that usually front run, that is going to hurt your trade. This is because your front runner will have to battle with the other front runners to be the front runner, and this can lead to all the front runners burning themselves out early in the race. Form lines are useful for traders. Here's how direct form lines work. Let's say horses A and B have raced previously and they're racing again today. The last time that they raced, horse A beat horse B by one length. Horse A doesn't necessarily need to have won the race. Horse A could have come second and horse B could have come third or fourth. The main point is that there was a length between them. Let's say that horse A is two pounds worse off in the weights compared to its previous race against horse B. How do we calculate where the horses should finish in relation to each other in today's race? Well, it depends on the distance of the race. And here's a list of distances and the number of pounds per length that I'm currently using. I'm not guaranteeing that these numbers are correct. I saw a different set of numbers in a racing publication years ago, and when I was making this video, I heard a racing commentator say that five furlongs is three pounds per length. And I'd, heard that I'd learned that it should be four pounds per length. So I decided to check on the pounds per length adjustment on various websites on the internet, and it seems as if the commentator was right, and this is the set of numbers to go with. My old numbers weren't massively out. In any case, you have to estimate an adjustment for different goings. For example, on soft or heavy going, the weight is likely to have more impact compared to on good to firm or firm going. Therefore, I assume that these adjustments apply to good going on turf and standard going on the all weather. So, back to the race between horse A and horse B. So, horse A is two pounds worse off in the weights compared to its previous race against horse B. You don't have to do much maths here. If the race was a seven to eight furlong race, you can see that the horses should dead heat. Therefore, if the race is longer than eight furlongs, horse B should win. If the, horse, if the race is shorter than seven furlongs, horse A should win. So this is what is known as a direct form line. So what are collateral form lines? With collateral form lines, horse A and B have never met. However, both have raced against horse C. In this case, we have a line through horse C, whereby we can compare horses A and B. And it doesn't matter whether horse C is or isn't in the race today. So we would work out where horse A would be at today's weights in relation to horse C. Then we'd, we would work out where horse B would be at today's weights in relation to horse C. And horse C might have been carrying a different weight in the two races, therefore you'd have to make an adjustment for that. And I'm assuming that if you got this far in the video, that you can do this type of calculation. 
So how are form lines useful? Well, there are a lot of situations where form lines are useful. I'll give you an example. In this race, the favourite Jarwal and the rank outsider Indian Sounds had met in their previous race. So let's have a look at their previous race. You can see that Jarwal beat Indian Sounds by two short heads, which is less than a length. In addition, Jarwal was all out when it won its race, and this suggests that the horse didn't have a lot left in the tank. Ideally, when you look at form lines, neither horse won the race. You never know if the last time out winner did have a bit more in the tank. So Indian Sounds is better, two pounds better off at the weights. If you look at the official ratings, Indian Sounds ca carried six pounds less than Jarwal in the previous race, and in this race, Indian, Indian Sounds is carrying eight pounds less. In addition, the race conditions were the same as in the pre it, it, were the same in the previous and the current race. The going was good to firm. The distance was five furlongs, and both races were even at the same racetrack, Doncaster. So, with less than a length difference between the two horses in the previous race, we should expect Indian Sounds to beat Jarwal. Now, I've seen enough of these kind of situations to know that someone, somewhere, knows more than we do, and this doesn't mean that Indian Sounds will reverse the placings. So I thought, OK, perhaps Jarwal is better than the two short heads win over Indian Sounds. At the same time, I thought that Indian Sounds could go close. That is, close enough to dob from its high price. So Indian Sounds was neglected in the market up until two minutes pre-race. I put my back bet in at that point. Now, I don't know if Indian Sounds dobbed from the Betfair SP. However, it did dob from the price that I took. By the time the race started, I was already a quarter of the way towards my dob. I did consider taking the money before the race started, but in the end I decided to hang in there. But to be honest, I think that my dob only just got there, so it probably didn't dob from the Betfair SP. But this is one way in which form lines can help traders. I could have just done a pre-race back lay trade or a dob trade. And in addition, you should note that I checked class and speed ratings and, uh, and the speed ratings of all of the other horses under today's race conditions before deciding to make this trade. I checked everything. And this isn't the strongest example that I could have explained. The race just came up while I was making this video, and I kind of feel as if I got a bit lucky with the dob. However, the odds coming down at two minutes pre is not unusual for such horses if they've been neglected in the market. Before I conclude, there's one variable that I forgot to mention. That is where the trainer's horses are running to form. The numbers that are circled represent the percentage of a trainer's horses that are running to form. You can click on the trainer's name to see how many wins and the percentage of wins obtained by a trainer over the last 14 days. You'll usually find small sample sizes. However, if you look beyond the 14 days, you're not looking at recent form any longer. Therefore, we have to make do with this estimate. Trainer form is obviously important if you're going in play. However, even with pre-race trading, trainer form may be important. For example, the market may be more positive towards a horse that is trained by a trainer who is getting a lot of winners. 
So these are the types of horses that I focus on with my trades. Generally, what I'm trying to do is find horses that have claims to being the winner of the race on at least one important form variable. Then I look at the other aspects of the horse's form, such as going, distance, and whether the form is recent. If one of these horses is an early drifter, the early drift is more likely to represent weakness. As I said, when the market hates a horse with strong form, this is likely to be real. And this idea especially applies to a favourite. So what about non-favourites? With non-favourites, when you identify horses that have potential to win, you have more choices on how to trade. Often, the market likes these horses. However, even when the market doesn't appear to like these horses, money frequently comes for these horses close to the start of the race. And this market move might not be sustained. If it isn't sustained, I often manage to get out with a scratch trade or a small loss. So, your choices with non-favourites are, you can trade these pre-race, if the odds are long enough, you can dob, and you can also trade pre-race and dob them. But here's a warning, you shouldn't lay the favourite instead of backing your own horse. The exception might be if the favourite falls into the category of being an early dr drifter. If you think that the odds of your non-favourite are going to come down and you turn out to be right, you will usually make more money by trading your own horse rather than laying the favourite. When I first started trading, I would lay the favourite because I anticipated that the odds of the second favourite would come down. And I was usually right about the odds of the second favourite coming down. However, I wouldn't make any money. In this situation, the favourite's odds would often just stop where they were, or they would go up or down by just a few ticks. And remember, I'm saying that I couldn't make money by laying the favourite before the odds of the second favourite came down. The gurus claim that they make money by laying the favourite after they've seen the odds of the second favourite come down. So finally... I want to ask a question. Are you a blue pill trader or a red pill trader? The idea of taking the blue or red pill comes from the 1999 film The Matrix and the concept has been used inappropriately by some gurus. So what is in the blue pill? The answer is superstition in the form of volume bars, resistance points and advanced charts. The blue pill reminds me of the stories about witch doctors who convince their tribe that when they hear thunder, it's because the gods are angry with them. And the witch doctor might offer the tribe a video pack full of rituals to stop the gods being angry. And the video pack comes at a price, of course. Then when the tribe buy the video pack and still hear thunder, the witch doctor convinces the tribe that there's nothing wrong with the video pack and that they still hear thunder because they're not doing the rituals correctly. In other words, the witch doctor tells the tribe that there is something wrong with them and not the video pack. So what is in the red pill? The red pill is a back to reality pill. We use form and real life variables to trade. With this method, you have clear variables that you can work with. You can anticipate how each variable might affect the horse's odds and its chances of winning. And even if you don't win straight away, which hardly anyone does, you have a model that you can build on and tweak. You have a set of variables that are understandable. You're not some poor lost soul who spends years trying to figure out what the crack is with those volume bars in advanced charts. And the way the gurus have convinced people into believing we should not look at the same variables as punters is by repeatedly saying we are traders and not punters. The fact is, as traders, we are punters. 
were just betting on different outcomes compared to regular punters. Anyway, that's all for this video. Take care.